Welcome, welcome everyone. Please find your seats, we'll get started. My name is Jake Gassaway. I'm one of the account executives here on Google Cloud Sales Team. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to come visit with us on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, from a logistical perspective, you all came in through the foyer there. That's where we're gonna have our meet up and have some drinks afterwards. So please stay with us if you have an opportunity. We're gonna have, uh, Lack's gonna stick around for a while and answer some questions as well. Um, as you saw, there's restrooms out there, so feel free if you need to use the facilities. You'll notice in the refrigerator, this is one of the things you'll learn about Google, is all the healthy stuff is visible, all the unhealthy stuff is hidden behind the cloud. So if you want something unhealthy, feel free to dig a little bit, you'll find something good. Um, so again, thanks for coming. I, just to give you a little bit of background on how we got here today, um, Lack is gonna come up in just a couple minutes, but. We started this idea late last year where uh, we were gonna have a machine learning expert come in and speak with some customers. And one of the things that you'll realize very quickly about Google is we like to do things at scale. And when we had the opportunity to bring Lack in to talk to customers, we started thinking, okay, let's get the schedule up. Let's have customers fill the slots for when he's gonna be here. And that happened unbelievably quickly. Um, people have have this idea that they wanna to talk to Google about machine learning and it's really great that you've all come here today because as you'll hear from Lack, this is, this is the next frontier. From a, from a company standpoint, we have said that we are an AI first organization now and we wanna share a lot of those capabilities with partners and customers. So there's a huge need out there for people to get educated on these materials. Uh, we wanna help you with that journey today and like I said, um, the slots filled up quickly, so we said let's open it up to customers. So that's where the idea of this afternoon came to be. Um, and then we also wanted to include partners as well. So there's a lot of people here. Please feel free to hang out afterwards. Like I said, get to know each other. We're gonna have about an hour of content, and then there's gonna be a Q&A session. There are microphones in uh, different locations, or we can have some Google folks um, running around with the microphone, please ask your questions because what we have also found is as more people ask questions in a larger group, it spurs ideas and gives people different directions that they can go. So with that, I'm gonna bring up Lack Lakshman on. He uh, leads our, um, he's our technical lead for our professional services organization. Prior to coming to Google, he was a director at the Climate Corporation and he was doing analytics around weather. He can probably tell you a lot more about that than I can. Um, and then uh, right now, um, our professional services organization, um, we do a lot of Coursera and Quick Labs learning. So if you haven't heard anything about that, please talk to your Google rep to give you some more insight on how you can also help develop some of these capabilities within your organization. Okay, so with that, Lack, come on up. Thank you. Bring a warm welcome to the Lack. Thanks, Jake. <coughs> Thank you, Jake. And uh, I, as Jake said, I'm Lack, and what I'm gonna do is basically give you a pretty technical talk of leading you towards like the, where you start and basically building an end-to-end -end machine learning uh, system on Google Cloud. So we'll go through the complete development process. And uh, the, uh, this is basically what I'm gonna be doing is what in Google we call a code lab. So there's a bunch of instructions that we can go through. I'll show you what those look like. But here's a link to the code lab. So if you have a phone, go ahead and take a photograph because this is something it's really meant for you to do, right? It's one thing for you to watch me do it, but it's another thing for you to spend some time going through it and doing it by yourself. So feel free to like, you know, go, go off and when you go back home, try out all the things that I'm gonna be doing here. And also there's the link to the deck itself all right, uh, which is all, also up there. Cool. Last photograph done. Cool. Okay. Okay. So basically what we're gonna be talking about is that we're gonna basically talk about machine learning on Google Cloud. And as I said, we'll be basically going through the like very systematic process of how you go about doing an ML problem. Like ML gets so much buzz these days that sometimes you're not sure what is real, what isn't. So part of the, the reason for a talk like this is to demystify it. Say this is exactly what you do. This is exactly the steps that you go through in terms of an ML project. So we look at what machine learning at the Google Cloud is, 
And then we look at the steps, which is essentially about exploring the data, creating a data set so that you can use it for ML, building a machine learning model, in our case, a TensorFlow model, and then probably the thing that scares everyone, operationalizing the model. How do you take a model that you've built and actually put it into production so that you can actually use it? Okay. So what we'll be using is distributed TensorFlow. So this is TensorFlow at scale, not TensorFlow on one machine, but TensorFlow on a bunch of machines. And as with any piece of software, TensorFlow has a variety of layers of abstraction. At the very bottom are the hardware components. The idea behind TensorFlow is that it's portable to different platforms. So you can run TensorFlow on a CPU, on a GPU, on an Android phone, on cloud TPUs, et cetera, and then you have a C++ layer that basically talks to this hardware, a Python layer that's kind of low-level numeric processing, and then you start getting into the more neural network kinds of components. And finally, at the top layer, TF Estimator, which is this very high-level, out-of-the-box API that will help you do distributed training. So that's the level at which we're going to be working at. We'll be basically working at the top level of the TensorFlow stack, and we'll basically write a TensorFlow model, and then we'll run it at scale on Cloud ML Engine. So why are we using TensorFlow? The reason we're using TensorFlow is that you have a lot of machine learning frameworks out there, SkyKit-Learn, SparkML, a variety of them, and they all can handle what I call toy problems. And what I mean by a toy problem is there's a problem whose data set fits in memory, right? A small enough problem, right? Pretty much any machine learning framework can handle. But once your data set gets large, and the reason that it gets large is that if you want to build effective machine learning models, you need three things. The first thing and most important thing is that you need data, lots of data. And the thing is that once you have large amounts of data, then you basically need to take your data and batch it, distribute it, do this training on multiple machines. So you have to take your data and you have to do batching and distribution. The second thing is you want to do what's called feature engineering, right? And this is true not just of big data. If you want to build effective machine learning systems, you want to do feature engineering. And one of the most effective ways of doing feature engineering, which I'll talk about, is called feature crosses. This is this idea that you take two features that are independent normally, and you cross them. And before you can cross them, it turns out that you typically have to discretize them. And we will do this in our example where we'll take two columns of data, and from those two columns of data, we'll make 20,000 columns of data. And that is basically what's going to give us an extreme amount of power and capability, right? So the, when we talk about a large data set, it's not just the number of rows in your data, it's also the number of columns in your data. And notice what I just said. I'm gonna take two columns and basically make it 20,000 columns, right? And that's basically what makes our system more powerful. So the second aspect about feature engineering is that you, know, you need it for doing effective ML, and if you want to do that kind of feature engineering, you want to do pre-processing, you want to create features out of the raw data that you have, then you need a very powerful machine learning framework. And that's where TensorFlow comes in. And the third aspect, again, if you want to build effective ML, is that you want to be able to do fancy, good architectures, right? We want to do like state-of-the-art architectures and that is essentially another reason why we use TensorFlow. It's the most popular machine learning framework, and the reason that's important is that a lot of machine learning research happens with TensorFlow. So what that means is that when you're basically building your models, you want to basically build it on the state-of-the-art system, the things that is likely to contain the new stuff. So that's the reason why we use TensorFlow. But what else does a machine learning framework need to provide? So sure. TensorFlow, the open source machine learning framework from Google, helps you do this large data problems, sophisticated data problems. But what else? What else do you need out of a machine learning framework? Well, you might want to do hyperparameter tuning, right? You basically, when you do ML, you pick a lot of parameters just out of a hat. You make a, you make a wide guess of them. 
but you never know that they're great. So you want to basically do hyperparameter tuning. But the other thing that you want to do is that you want to take your model and you want to deploy it. You want to basically make it a microservice. And you want to basically scale that microservice to as many queries per second as you need. You want to auto-scale your microservice. And not only that, your model is going to be written in Python. Is your operational system, your website, is it always written in Python? No. So you want to be able to basically access your model, which is in Python, in TensorFlow. You want to wrap it up in such a way that you can access it from a wide variety of systems. And for us, today, the easiest way to access something from a wide variety of systems is to make something available through a REST API. So we want to take our model, we want to basically put it into a web application, deploy it so we can access it using a REST API. That's great. Okay? But there's one thing, right? And I said, like, the hardest thing about ML is taking this model that you've built and operationalizing it. Why is that hard? Because it turns out okay, that there's one like, no, monster lurking in the swamp. And the monster is this. Remember I said as a like, throwaway, we're going to take a couple of features and we're going to feature cross them and make lots and lots and lots of features? Who's going to do that for you at prediction time? So your client, you can expect them to give you the raw data. But how do they know all these feature processing and creation and all these things that you have done? Notice that at the top during training, we do all that feature creation and everything. But at prediction time, we still need to do that because our model still expects right, all of these new features that we have crafted. The question is, who does it? And that's the problem, right? And so that's the, so besides the open source framework, which does the, you know, all of the things in terms of being able to write your models, what Cloud ML Engine does is that it gives you the ability to scale them, to remember the feature processing, doing all of those kinds of things as well. It's what basically completes the picture and allows you to take a research model, a model written with open source, and easily operationalize it and easily productize it. Okay? So the way we're going to do it is that we're going to basically use what's called Cloud Data Lab. It's a Jupyter notebook. And we're going to basically take a small data set. We're going to develop our TensorFlow model. And then we're going to basically scale it out to Google Cloud using all serverless tools. Right? So we're not going to ever basically create a cluster. You will never see me install any piece of software. Right? It'll all just exist. Right? And I'll be basically using a bunch of services to basically walk through this entire workflow. Okay? So this is basically the end-to-end machine learning set of, set of labs. So these are each of the labs that I'm going to demo as we go along. So we'll start with taking our data, exploring it, visualizing it, creating a sample data set of it. Number three, building a TensorFlow model. Once we have a model, number four, basically going ahead and creating our larger data set that we can use for machine learning training. And then number five, basically doing the training on the cloud. Number six, basically deploying the service. And then finally, accessing it from a web application. So just to know where we're headed, actually I'll show you this in a little bit. Just, okay. So we're basically going to go through, so let's start with the first thing, which is to explore the data. But what is the problem that we're going to try to solve? The problem that I'm going to solve is that I want to go ahead and predict the weight of a baby. Okay, so a newborn baby, right? We want to basically predict the weight. It's a pretty cool problem because once a baby is born, you know exactly what the weight is. Right? So, but basically, before the baby is born, during the mother's pregnancy, we want to predict the weight of a baby. Why would we do that? Well, it turns out that this is actually a pretty useful thing to do, because not all babies get the care they need. You may want to basically line up the appropriate medical attention, incubators, all of those kinds of things. And you want to basically be able to predict what the weight of the baby is going to be. But where is our data going to come from? Well, the US government helpfully has captured right, every baby born in the US. Right? We basically have the information about all of those births. It's a public data set available from the US De Department of Health. It basically all the births recorded in the 50 states. 
and I'm going to use the data from 69 to 2008, right? It's uh, in our public data set on BigQuery, which is our data warehouse. It's about 22 gigabytes. It's about 137 million rows. Decent-sized data set. We can use it. We can use it to demonstrate like things that, that go on in terms of basically uh, you know, using it to basically do our predictions. Okay. So this data set basically includes details about the pregnancy. When was the baby born? Location of the birth? the baby's birth weight, which is important because that's our label, right? With the machine learning data set, what do you need? You need the input data and you need the actual true value. You need the label. The label is there. After the baby is born, you know what the weight of the baby is. That's our label. And then you have a bunch of information like the duration of the pregnancy, the mother's age, et cetera. Right? So you have a bunch of information that we could use to predict the weight of the baby. Fair enough? Okay. So this is basic. So let's, to, to know where we are headed, this is basically where we are going to be headed. What I want to do is to basically say, I'm going to go to, like, provide the doctor a tool that looks like this. right? The mom has come in. Mom's 28 years old. And it is now the 45th week of pregnancy. Hopefully, that's too long. So let's say it's the 38th week of pregnancy. <laughs> OK? So it's the 38th week of pregnancy. And it's twin babies, right? Both like male kids. What is the weight going to be? 6.3 pounds. Fair? This is basically what I want to build. This is my end goal, right? We want to basically provide this application at the doctor's office so they can quickly basically get the predicted weight for every uh, mom, right, that walks into the doctor's office, right? So let's go ahead and start building this. Okay. Now, this data set that I did was actually what's called structured data. And the reason I chose that is that even at Google, right, you hear all these things about images and speech and translation and all of those kinds of things. Structured data is the most common type of data. Like nearly two thirds of our models are structured data. Right? So it is, as a business, as an enterprise, the most common kind of machine learning model that you build will be on structured data. It will be a table of data just like that baby data that I showed you. That's what you're going to be doing. You're going to have something. You're going to have sales. You're going to have you know, something that you're trying to predict. And you're basically trying to predict the demand. You're trying to predict the sale. You're, predict, you're predicting whether the machine is going to fail or not. You're going to predict like, the next repair time. All of these things are just structured data. So first step okay, is we're going to basically take this BigQuery data set, and we'll basically find the features that we want to use in our model. And remember that at the beginning, I posted this code lab link. This is what this looks like. Okay? So the num first lab is to explore the data. And it says that basically go down here and click on, so I'm going to go to the Cloud Console. I'm going to click on something to start Cloud Shell. So that's my Cloud Shell. Okay. And the step is to basically go ahead and find the compute zones that exist, and then go ahead and create a data lab inst instance. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's uh, list the compute zones. And so we basically see that, well, probably use US Central 1B. That may be a reasonable zone. And I need to basically do a data lab create. I think I had it called uh, baby weight. So let's just do baby weight. And in that zone, so let's create that data lab instance. And meanwhile, let's go to the next step, which is to invoke BigQuery. So I'll go to BigQuery. Okay? And I can do this by going down here and going to BigQuery. But I know the URL, so I'll just do BigQuery. And once I'm in BigQuery, so all the data set is there. I'll go here, and I'll say that I want to basically run a query. The query that I want to run is this query. 
So what is, what is that query doing? Okay. Control shift plus, okay. So I'm selecting plurality. What is plurality? Single kid, twins, triplets, etc. How many babies are born at that time? And the count of that plurality as a number of babies. So the total number of babies that were born, that are twins, that are, that are single kids, et cetera. The average weight in pounds of all singles, all twins, et cetera, right, from this data set, public data samples natality, between the years 2000 and 2005, grouped by plurality. Let's go ahead and run the query. So we run the query, and 2.4 seconds later, we basically get back that there were how many ever millions that is, right, uh, of single kids, 507,000 twins, 27,000 triplets, uh, no, 1,800 quadruplets, and 325 quintuplets, I think, whatever it's called, right, five kids. Okay. Okay. So what, does, what did this actually happen, right? Let's go back here. So we are in public data. Okay. Uh, BigQuery public data. I switch to project. I have way too many projects that I have access to. But I'll go down here and say I want to do public data. So there is public data, samples, natality. And if you look at the details, this was 137 million rows, right? We just did a query, an ad hoc query, on 137 million rows, and how long did it take us? Two, three seconds, okay? Pretty cool. All right, so let's go back to the code lab. So basically now we know like what, how many numbers we have. Let's, but this is kind of cool, I just got the numbers, but what we really want are graphs. We want something visual. And that's where Data Lab comes in. So let me copy that thing, and by this time, let me just go back to my, uh, this guy, okay, oh. Okay, sorry. Okay, let's go back to here. I, I didn't hit the yes <laughs> in time. Okay, so we have the plurality. Let's go ahead and try a different query. Okay, so let's do this. Instead of plurality, let's do uh, is male. Right? Are these male kids, female kids? Right? And the number of kids and the average weight. So let's do a show of hands. How many people think? that male babies and female babies should be approximately the same weight? How many people think female babies should be heavier? Male babies should be heavier. Okay, you guys are smarter than me. Before I did this, I had no idea, right? And I thought that all babies, babies, right? They should all be the same weight. <laughs> so it turns out that male babies on average are 7.4 pounds, and female babies on average are 7.1 pounds. And this is over a massive amount of data, right? Eight, more, eight, more, eight million babies, so you can be sure that's all statistically significant and everything, right? So this is like a serious difference in terms of which babies are, uh, are heavier than uh, you know, the other babies. So let's go down here, let's see. What else? Uh, we can do gestation weeks as well. So that's the third factor that we'll be looking at, is gestation weeks. So let's group this by gestation weeks, and maybe order by gestation weeks. And as you would expect, when you do this, Preemie babies, right, will be lower weight, right? So babies that are born at like 24 weeks are like 1.7 pounds. As the time goes on, babies get heavier, right? And by the 38th week, they're pretty much full term. Okay. So the, the, that's the kind of insight that you can basically gather 
from this data. So I've looked at like three things, right? The gender of the baby, right? Whether it's a single, it's a triplet or a twin, et cetera, and the gestation weeks. And we just saw that all three of these have some impact on the weight of a baby. So these are all factors that go into our model. There's a lot more in that data set, but these three should be good enough in order for us to basically go ahead and, uh, and do our analysis. Questions? I'm still waiting for this to be working. Okay. I'm still waiting for Data Lab to be reachable. So let me, while that's going on, So I'll, I'll show you that as soon as that comes up. But this is essentially what the graph that we're going to be creating as soon as that uh, instance comes up is going to be. Essentially, it's going to basically show what we just saw on the command line, right? Female baby is 7.1 pounds. Male baby is about 7.4 pounds. So there is a difference. And you will basically see that there is a drop off as, an, as the plurality increases, the weight of the baby goes down. Right? So these are factors that we use. Okay. Okay. So what features would you use? You would basically use features that essentially play a part in terms of it. So if you have a feature that has an impact like this, would you use it? This is a gestation weeks, and this is basically the weight of the baby. Absolutely, right? It's pretty clear that the weight of the baby is affected by the gestation weeks. The other thing that you should look at, though, is the number of babies that are born at that particular gestation week. So for example, right, when we are down here, it's about 10 power 7 babies. We have no problem. We have enough data for like, you know, the 38th week or the 39th week. However, when you look at the 17th week and 18th week, we don't have enough, enough examples. And we have to be really careful about basically overfitting if we start using data at that really low end levels. And you will see that when we build our models, we will start to bucketize and we'll basically treat all babies born before, like say, the 20th week as essentially being born at 20 weeks to basically kind of combine them together to make sure that we have enough data. Yay. All right, so now we can basically go down here and uh, preview change support to port 81, change and preview. So we have our data lab instance. This is our Jupyter notebook. And what I will go ahead and do is that I will basically create a notebook. And having created the notebook, I can basically take and run this Python code. So we will run this Python code. This is essentially going to run the same data lab, same BigQuery query, and basically go ahead and create those graphs that I was just showing you. Oh, well, I should do an import, shouldn't I? Let's run this first, and then run that. Yeah, sure. So, so basically, this is essentially the, the data that we got from when we ran it on the console, right? So if it's uh, uh, so this this is the data, and then I'm going to get the distinct values for a particular column name. In this case, the is male, right? And we're basically getting the graph that is basically saying 7.1 pounds, 7.4 pounds. So you can do this for the other columns and get those, those graphs that are showed on the slide. And basically, the analysis process that you go through is that you say, does it play an impact? And secondly, do I have enough data? 
right? Those are the two questions that you always ask to decide whether or not you're gonna use a feature or not use a feature. Actually, there is another question that you should ask, and that question is what this is about. You wanna make sure that whatever you're using is legal and ethical to use, right? So it turns out that in that data set, there's other features about the mother, about the pregnancy that, that have been collected that aren't allowed, that we can't use it. So you wanna basically make sure that you can. But the other aspect that you wanna think about when you're creating this data set is just because you have some data historically doesn't mean that you can use it in the model. What do you mean by that? Okay. Remember that I said that we have in our data set whether it's a male baby or a female baby. We have it in the historical data because after the baby is born, it's there. But before the baby is born, which is when we're gonna do the prediction, will we know? You guys see the problem? We wanna basically predict, and at the time of doing the prediction, whether or not we, we know depends on whether an ultrasound is carried out or was not carried out. So without an ultrasound, we don't know the sex of the baby, and it turns out we may not be able to distinguish between twins and triplets and quadruplets. We know it's a single baby or multiple babies, but we don't really know how many. So this is a very common problem, partial data. Right? Data that you know from your, in a historical archive because you've collected it or you collected it later, but at prediction time, you don't actually know. So this is a very real world situation. Right? So how do you deal with it? What we're gonna do is that we're basically gonna go ahead and mask some of this data, right? So we're gonna mask some of this data, and that's basically what, this, uh, what our second notebook is gonna be. But the second notebook is also gonna be about taking our data set and making it smaller so we can develop our model. We're not gonna develop our model on 137 million rows. We will do that last, when we basically scale out the training. While we are developing our model, We'll just pick a small data set, let's say 10,000 rows, that's enough. But the question is, when you're creating those 10,000 rows, how do you get those 10,000 rows? The easiest thing to do is to say, I'm just going to basically sample the rows randomly. Right? You're basically going to take your data, do rand, right? and basically say, uh, put 70% like of the data in training and 30% of the data in evaluation. You could do that. But in our particular data set, that's gonna be a problem. And this is, again, a very realistic kind of problem that you will face in all your real world situations. What is the problem? If we just take our rows of data and say randomly, 70% of the data goes into training and 30% of the data goes into evaluation, we run into the triplet problem. What's a triplet? Three babies, born at the same time, to the same mom, right? So the input data for all three babies is exactly the same. Everyone okay with that? Right? You have three rows in your data set for which the input data is exactly the same. And then if you go out and you basically say, I'm gonna randomly take one row and put it in training, another row and put it in evaluation, you get what's called leakage. You have some data now that is present in both training and evaluation. Right? This is a very common problem, actually. Right? You're doing like flight logistics, two flights that take off on the same day, very, very, very likely that they're affected by the same weather. That's leakage as well, right? You're basically trying to do maintenance, and you're basically trying to do predictive maintenance, and you've collected two time series data, and both time series data are from the same machine, they are very likely related to each other. So you have to be very, very, very careful about how you split your data, right? Don't use rent. Think about what you're splitting your data on. So in our case, we're gonna actually split our data based on the date that the baby was born, with the assumption that right, triplets are all born on the same day. 
Well, yeah, sure, they can be born around midnight and they could be in separate things. We'll kind of ignore that for now. Okay. So that's the second notebook. Okay, so we're basically going to go to the code lab, and this is the second one. And rather than copy and paste, what I'm basically going to do is basically git clone this notebook, and you can actually go in here, and I've already done this, I believe. So I can go into training data analyst, okay? And uh, let's see, actually, let me go down here. Let me go down to uh, data lab, untitled notebook, okay, there it is. Let me start afresh. So can I delete this? Oh, it doesn't let me do it. OK. Rename. OK. Cool. So let's go down here, add a code, and do what the lab tells me to do, which is to git clone that repo. So I'll go down here and I'll just get clone the repo. And so basically, I'm just downloading uh, the latest version of the notebooks. So there it is. I have my training data analyst. And in there, I believe we ask you to go to uh, structured and number two. So I'll just go down there. So I don't need this anymore. Leave. There we are. Machine learning. Uh, deep dive. Structured. Okay. So there it is. That's my second notebook. And here, so now I can basically, I've just cloned it. I've gotten it from the Git repo. I, the first one is just setting up the project. And we can move that. So the next thing that I'm basically doing is that the same queries as I did before. I'm getting my label, the weight in pounds. I'm getting the gender of the baby, is it male or female? The age of the mother, the plurality, single, twins, et cetera. The gestation weeks that I'm going to use to predict. And now you know why I'm getting the hash month, right? I'm taking the, the day that the baby was born, right? Or the month that the baby was born. I'm basically putting babies born in the same month is going to be in training or is going to be in validation. They're not going to be get split among each other. So I'm going to do that. And that's my query. And it turns out that we can now go ahead and get the query and then go ahead and pick a really small subset of this data set. So I'm, what am I using here? When I use that two data frame, I'm basically getting back pandas. How many of you know what pandas is? Okay. Good, significant. Okay, so pandas is basically a Python package that lets you do data analysis. It's a very convenient way to go ahead and do this. So I basically have a pandas data frame for training, a pandas data frame for evaluation. This is basically my data set in BigQuery. And how, how big was that data set? It was humongous. It was 137 million rows. But notice that in my previous notebook, I took those 137 million rows, and I made a graph of it. Right? I was able to do that because I did all the accumulation and addition in BigQuery, and I got back a small pandas data frame, and I visualized it in Python. So that's the same thing I'm doing now. I'm basically taking this large data set, and I'm basically getting a small portion of it so it fits into the main memory. And I'm basically, I now have 15,000 samples in the training data set and about 1,500 in the evaluation data set. I'll use this to develop my model. Does that make sense? I'm going to use this to develop my model. And so here's the first part of the model. I can basically go ahead and look at what's in the data. But notice something strange. The count is the number of rows. There are 1,495 plurality, but only 1,498 weight in pounds. How can that be? 
Somebody forgot to record the weight in pounds. Can that happen? Sure, this is a real world data set, of course, right? So you have some missing data in there. So what we're gonna do is that I'm gonna basically use pandas to basically go ahead and find only rows in which the weight of pounds is greater than zero, mother's age is greater than zero, gestation weeks is greater than zero, all of these things greater than zero, make sure that they all exist. And then I'm going to basically take these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and replace them by strings, single, twins, triplets, et cetera, because I can't explain what plurality is enough time, so I'll just do singles, twins, et cetera. I'll make them all strings. And then I'll basically also, okay, do a no ultrasound. So this is the cool thing. Remember what I talked about, right? Sometimes we may know the data, sometimes we may not do it at prediction time. We have to train the model to deal with both situations, with ultrasound when we know everything, and without ultrasound when, what am I doing without ultrasound? Without ultrasound, the plurality is either single or multiple. And the is male is unknown. So for every input data set, I create two rows. For every row in my input, I create two rows in my output, one with ultrasound, one without ultrasound. Pretty easy, right? So at this point then, I basically have right, my new data set. So the front part of the data set is where everything is known, and the bottom part of the data set is where things are not known, I think. Okay. Oh, because I have not run it yet. I should run it, shouldn't I? Okay. So head and tail. Yeah, so the bottom of the data set, everything. So, so I've now doubled the size of my data set, right? And so basically I have my data, and then I can basically do a describe, and now I basically see that now all the counts are identical, and notice that the counts are all double what they were before. Right? We had about 14,000 before, now we have about 30,000. Cool? So this is my pre-processing, my creation of the data set. I go from my raw data, I create something, and then I basically write out CSV files, right? So, okay, data set, write out a CSV file, and then I can basically look at the CSVs and I have about 60,000 here and 27,000 there, and that's basically my data. I can now use this data to train my model. So that's my next step. So at this point, I've done number one. I've explored, I've visualized the data set. I've done number two. I've created a small data set so I can build my model. So now I'm on to number three to develop a TensorFlow model. Everyone with me so far? Okay. So, we are now here, building the model. So the model that I want to build is for structured data, and structured data, it turns out, there are two types of features in structured data. You have what are called dense features. Like if, you, if, if you're, for example, you want to predict the, like whether somebody's going to be satisfied with their ice cream service, right? You may have the price of the ice cream and the person who served it to them, right? And are they going to customer satisfaction? The price of the ice cream, $2.50, that's a dense feature because it's a continuous number, right? Whereas the employee ID, right? You have five employees in your ice cream store. The employee ID is not a numeric thing, right? It's not like employee ID 72365 is double employee ID 36,180, right? It's, that's not the case, it's not a numeric field. So what you do is you tend to do what's called one-hot encoding. You take that field, 72365, and you say I have five employees, their IDs are 8345, 72345, et cetera, and if, it, if, this employee, if this ice cream was served by employee number 72345, you put that as a one, you put the rest of the employees as zero, and that, that way you have this independent columns. Okay, this is one of the things what I meant by the number of rows, in, number of columns in your data 
raw columns doesn't equal the number of columns in your machine learning data set. It can get larger, right? So here's one of the reasons why that could happen, right? You're basically taking these sparse features. Everyone okay with that? So in your, in your typical data set, you have dense features and you have sparse features. So quick quiz. Uh, gestation weeks, dense feature or sparse feature? Dense, it's a continuous number, right? Plurality, dense feature or sparse feature? Sparse. Everyone cool? So it turns out that deep neural nets, the things that you hear all the buzz about, they're very good for dense features. They're not that good for sparse features. Why are they not good for sparse features? Because sparse features look like this. You have a sea of zeros with a one kind of snuck in there. And if you basically add and divide these, and that's what neural networks do. They add and add and subtract and multiply and things. And you, you guys all know about zeros. You multiply something by zero, it becomes zero, right? So it basically just zeros start propagating everywhere. It doesn't actually give you much of a learning ability because zeros basically just, no, it doesn't work. Deep networks, it actually don't give you that much benefit if you have sparse features. For sparse features, they're in, they tend to be independent. The columns tend to be independent. And linear methods work really, really well. So which one do we use now? We have a data set that has both dense features and sparse features. So should we use a linear model because we have more sparse features than dense features? Well, with TensorFlow, the idea is you use a wide and deep model. The idea is that you get both. All your dense features, you pass them through the deep network, and all your sparse features, you pass them through the wide network. The idea behind the wide network is it's directly connected to the output, and the deep network, you have a bunch of layers through which you connect them to the output. So you basically decide on a feature-by-feature -feature basis which part of the network you want it to be, and you have a combined model that has both wide and deep. So how do we build that in TensorFlow? So we want to basically build a wide and deep network because the idea is that the deep part of the network lets you generalize and the wide part of the let network lets you memorize. So that's the theory behind this. The question is, how do you build it? Well, this is what you do. There's a class. So you basically say, I want to create a deep neural net linear combined classifier. Let's break that down. In this case, I'm doing a deep neural net. I'm doing a linear, and I'm combining them and I'm doing a classification. But of course, for the baby weight, we're not doing classification, right? What are we doing? Regression. So what would change? DNN, linear combined, regressor. Right, you have another class for it. So you basically create that class, specify what your linear features are, these are all your white columns, specify all your deep features, and how many you know, nodes you want in each of those places. So we do that, and we use it to create a TensorFlow model. So this is basically what that looks like. So number three, so that is number two. I'm going to go down here and pick number three. And the code, essentially, OK, looks like this. I have my CSV file. It contains the weight in pounds, is male, mother's age, plurality, gestation weeks, and my hash key. Okay? And my label column is a weight in pounds. And I basically say I want to read my data set. If it is training mode, just read it indefinitely. Keep looping over and over again because we're going to iterate. If it's evaluation, just read it once and tell me what my RMSE is. And when I'm going to read the data, I would like you to use, read it line by line right, and shuffle it. Okay, it turns out that when you do distributed training, you want to basically shuffle the data. So I'm asking you to shuffle it, decode the CSV, and basically get my features and get my label. And then 
Now I basically go through my data and I say the is male is a categorical column. It's called is male. The three values are true, false, and unknown. Why unknown? No ultrasound, right? And uh, mother's age is a numeric column. Plurality is a categorical column. These are the possible values. And gestation weeks is a numeric column. Right? And now I have my raw data columns. I'm going to do that uh, thing I talked about, feature crossing. So I'm going to basically take my mother's age, and I'm going to bucketize it between 15 and 45. So this is where I'm going to, it's going to memorize the data. I have enough data. I can actually start memorizing. Right? So I'm going to basically take my continuous column and make it a sparse column. Right? Remember what I said. Like sparse columns are good for memorization, and, and deep columns are good for uh, generalization. But it's not a, like either or. There's a little bit of gray in between. So we can take some of our deep columns and make them sparse, and we can take some of our sparse columns and make them deep. That's what I'm doing here. So I'm basically taking my deep column, mother's age, and making it sparse. And I'm taking the other deep column, gestation weeks, and making it sparse. So now I have the is male and plurality, which were originally sparse columns. And the two ages in gestation, I'm making them sparse. And I'm making them a white column. And then I'm basically saying, take my white columns, all these things, and essentially feature cross them. So create as logical ands. So what I'm doing is essentially I'm intuitively I'm saying, go ahead and learn what male twins born at 38 weeks, right, tend to be averaged at. That's what, it, what I'm telling the model to do. I'm telling the model to essentially do what we did with BigQuery, right, computing this average weight for each thing. I'm telling it to do it for every combination. How many combinations? I'm saying, oh, just take like 20,000 of them. This is what I meant by I'm going to take my two columns and make 20,000 columns out of it. But then I say, oh my god, no. 20,000 columns, I don't want to go give it and tell it to memorize all that because we had some things where we didn't have enough data. So what I'm then going to do is I'm going to say, take those 20,000 columns and project it back down to a dimensionality space of just three. So this is what's going to group them back together. And I'm going to basically get a deep column. So I have my mother's age, which is originally deep, gestation weeks, which is originally deep, and this new manufactured deep column that's going to basically let me generalize from my 20,000 back to something that is, that's called an embedding. It's going to basically learn this data. So at this point, I have my wide, I have my deep. So sure, right? At this point, you're saying, well, this looks pretty complicated. Do I have to know all this? Right? You could omit all of this. Okay? And I think we'll all agree that the first part is easy, right? Just take the raw data. Is it numeric? Is it categorical? And use it. And you will get 80% of the benefit of the model that I'm building. Okay? The rest of the stuff that it's doing, it's, it's the other like 10%, 15% boost. Okay? You don't have to do that. You will get a pretty good model, even if you don't do this feature crossing and embedding. But it's easy enough to do. Right? You, the first time you look at it, it looks strange and it looks complex. But the second time you look at it, you start getting it. And the third time, you just say, well, I'm just going to do it. Right? So you just do those. So we do that. And the next thing that we do is we want to basically make predictions out of it. And at prediction time, nobody's going to give us the embedding and the feature crossing and all that. We just ask for those four inputs. Is the baby male? The mother's age plurality, essentially, the four things that we're asking here. Right? So I'm saying my model is going to basically ask for those four things. And then I can basically go ahead and train. So let me go ahead and clear all the cells and just run all the cells. And this will just go through. And this is going to be relatively fast. And the reason it's going to be relatively fast is because I'm just training on 30,000 samples. I'm just doing it in data lab. But 
This by itself is not interesting. I'm not even going to bother looking at how well it does. My only point of doing this is to make sure the code compiles. Code compiles, it runs. So what's the next thing I do? I have to run it on my large data set. But I don't have the large data set yet. So I need to create that large data set. So that's basically going to be my next step. Right? So now I've done number three. I'm on to number four. I want to create my large data set. So, I want to up. so now this is where I'm moving from doing this little things in my data lab instance on that one thing to now doing things at scale over the large data set. I want to operationalize my model. So to do that, first step, I have to do the same thing that I did in Pandas. I have to basically create the ultrasound data and the no ultrasound data. Right? But I have to do this over the whole data set. Pandas was fine for doing our experimentation, but to do this kind of pre-processing at scale over the entire data set, we're going to use this thing called data flow. This is basically what's, what that's going to look like. So from this point, I'm just going to give you, uh, you know, quick pointers, but the idea is that you go back and you try it yourself, right? So I'm going to basically start from the same BigQuery query, and to create a CSV, I'm going to basically say, I'm going to create a no ultrasound data set and a with ultrasound data set. And I'm going to basically do those same things that I did in my pandas, right? So create the, the change, the plurality column, and so on. And then having done that, I'm going to run my pre-processing. And when I run my pre-processing, I'm going to say, please go ahead and run this entire thing on the cloud. And this is the steps. I'm going to read from BigQuery and I'm going to convert to CSV, and I'm going to write it to cloud storage. So I basically do this very simple three-step thing in Python. right? So read from BigQuery, create this extra data set, do the ultrasound, no ultrasound, clean up the data, do all of those pre-processing, write out the output files. And then from data lab, again as before, I can just clear all the cells, and I can run all of them. And this will take about 15 minutes or so, and it'll get auto-scaled to like 12 machines, which will just plow through the data, and the data will show up on the cloud. And I just did this from Data Lab, right? I didn't actually go create a cluster and install any software, right? I just said, go do it, right? And at this point now, we can basically go to the cloud console and we can go down here, we can go into data flow, and you will basically see that I just started the pre-process baby weight job. It's been running for like 23 seconds. The actual job takes like 20 minutes, okay? But if I take the job that, so I'll do the whole Julia Child thing. I've already have something that ran before. This is how it looks when it runs. You basically see this auto-scaling. It started out with like, you know, one worker said, oh, this is, this is a big job. I can't do it with one worker. Let me go ahead and make it three workers. It's still a big job. OK, I'm going to give you 15 workers, like plow through the data, and like you know, five and a half minutes later, boom, it's done. Right? So cool. So at this point now, we have our complete data set all created. We're now ready to do our training. So that's the next step. How do we train? So we take our TensorFlow model, which worked on one CPU on that 30,000 samples. And we need to take that thing and run it on the full data set over everything. So that's the next step, which is notebook number five, which is to do the training. And all that I have to do here is Again, just launch a program. I'm going to say G Cloud, ML Engine. This is the thing that's going to run TensorFlow. Here's a new job for you. Please run this code on TensorFlow 1.4 for 200,000 steps. What do I read? Right? Go ahead and read. Let's see, where's the. Oh, I see. Okay, I think I've just hard coded it in. So it's basically go ahead and going to read all of the data that's in my GCS bucket. So you can basically go to the storage bucket, 
uh, let's see. So we can go to our storage bucket, find cloud demos ML, and you can basically go to the baby weight and go look at the pre-process data. And here's all of the files. And it's basically going to go ahead and use all of these files that have been pre-processed, written by Dataflow, now basically getting trained by ML Engine. This takes about 60 minutes, but at the end of it, what will happen is that under baby weight, there will be a trained model, and this trained model will have all the TensorFlow checkpoints and everything stored. Again, I basically launch the training job just from a Dataflow instance. I'm not, no, just go, go do it for me. So we, we train it, and having trained it, the next thing is how to do hyperparameter tuning. Well, the hyperparameter tuning is, I don't know what my batch size needs to be, so I said, go try all these different batch sizes. Try these different embeddings. Remember that I said three, I took the 20,000, I made, projected down to three. Well, I made up the number three. Maybe 30 would be better, I don't know. So go try every number from 30 to three to 30. But it doesn't actually try every number. I say, I have a budget. Don't try more than 30 trials. Pick the best 30 trials to go try, explore the hyperparameter space and come back and tell me what is the best. And when we did that, it turns out that you know, certain hyperparameters, these are the hyperparameters that turned out to perform best for this model. A batch size of 35 and 16 embedding columns and a neural network size of 281. It worked, right? So that's basically the hyperparameters that worked and then you basically retrain the model with those hyperparameters, and now we have a final model. So we have our model. The next step, the final step, right, is to basically take this model that we have. Okay, so we've now our number five, we've executed the training, and the last thing, right, is to basically go ahead and deploy the model. To deploy the model, we're going to basically use Cloud ML Engine again. And it's going to basically get put into an App Engine app, and we're basically going to ex export it. So that is the final uh, lab in this thing, which is number six, to basically deploy the model. So the way you deploy the model, again, is just basically say, go ahead and create a new version of the model. And once you do that, anytime it receives a JSON request of this form, it's going to come back with a JSON prediction of this form. It's a REST web service that auto scales, and it's ready to go. And this is basically what we invoke from our web application. So essentially, what, what we have done so far, okay, is that we basically started from the data exploration, created a small data set, built the model, and then we took that same model and we trained it on a large data set. But that large data set was created using data flow. What is the advantage there? The advantage is that everything that you did in Python, right, on a historical data set can also be done on a real-time stream of data. So imagine that now your hospitals, every time a baby is born, that data is coming in, it's being sent to you. You can do that pre-processing on the fly using the same data flow pipeline, code unchanged, and you're basically using it to replenish your model and refresh it. Probably doesn't make sense for something like a baby weight, but it makes a lot of sense for something like a recommendation engine, right? Where you want to basically recommend based on the latest data. And the cool thing about creating a machine learning data set with data flow is that it lets you do that. This convert thing, everything that you did in historical data on batch data, you get to do the exact same thing on your real-time arriving stream. And that's part of this whole idea of Google makes operationalizing an ML model easy, right? Once you create a batch model, making it work in real-time is easy as long as you follow this approach, right? This exact approach that we outlined here.
Right? You basically start with a small thing, do a data lab, use data flow, create your large data set, train one ML engine, deploy, you're done. You now have an end-to-end -end ML working system that is easy to update and easy to refresh, easy to retrain. And with that, I'll take questions. Yes. Could you come to the mic? Uh, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the deployment phase. Right. Is that uh, different from using TensorFlow serving or? No, that? it is exactly the same as TensorFlow serving, except that the infrastructure and management of that we handle for you on the cloud side. But it is the, so the things that you do to a TensorFlow model and the, the export signature and the predictions that you would get when you do a TensorFlow serving, that's exactly the same. So this is essentially a service wrapped around TensorFlow serving, right? In such a way that you can just do it with a command line. But it is TensorFlow serving. And in general, that's going to be the, the case. It's all open source with the management and infrastructure. That's what cloud provides. So TensorFlow is open source, and we, have, we don't touch that part. The idea being that everything that you do on the cloud, if you want it, you could do on-premise. And you could do this hybrid, right? So we, we, are, we are very, very, very uh, cognizant of that. All the engineering teams are cognizant of that. So the, uh, the cloud ML teams have added things into TensorFlow, right? For example, the ability to read out of Google Cloud Storage from TensorFlow was added by the cloud teams, right? Or the ability to read from BigQuery was added with the cloud teams. But they didn't do it as a separate thing. They added it to the open source version, the idea being that it's one open source version that still works. So TensorFlow serving, and this is exactly the same. It's just the infrastructure management that we handle. Thank you. Sure. Yes. So for, oper for, for making it operational, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned creating the model, like making a web service out of it. Right. What about if I want to put it on a mobile app? The users don't have access to the web in some cases. Right. So yeah, that's a great question, right? So uh, I just talked about one, one way of operationalizing. We actually support four different ways of operationalizing. And I'll get to yours, right? So number one, the one that I just showed you was online prediction, right? The idea of basically. You, you have a web service up and running, and whenever you want a prediction, you invoke that web service and we get it back. You get back a prediction. That, but that is one aspect of it. There are two other ways that you can do it, in addition to the mobile, and that is basically a batch prediction. The idea is that you have a whole bunch of predictions, and every day, you basically say, here's a whole bunch of inputs. Give me the output for this entire bunch. Right? So rather than running a web service, you basically upload Right, your input data and you get back your predictions. And you basically do that on a schedule, on a batch, et cetera. And you can do this batch prediction kind of thing as a stream as well from a data flow. The idea is that as you get input data coming in, you're basically doing this batch prediction to basically do it. Okay, all these three rely on it being on the cloud. But then there's this fourth disconnected thing. The TensorFlow model is just on cloud storage. I showed you that, right? It's just a directory. So you can basically, after you train it, you can take that model, and then you can basically run a TensorFlow freeze program, which basically freezes all the weights, takes the variables, replaces them by constants, does a whole bunch of things to make the model smaller and more compact. And then once you have that, you can move that model onto an embedded device that has TensorFlow Lite installed on it. Right, so Android, for example, you can run TensorFlow Lite on it, and that lets you do on-device prediction. Okay? But there's uh, like two steps involved. One, you need to take the model, and you need to run this uh, freezing to kind of compress the model, and then you need to install TensorFlow Lite. But it's totally doable. Questions? Yes. Or, or you can ask me a question, I can repeat it. Okay. Um, so you, you show how to put any data in from, from a from a public website. Right. Um, I was curious to know if you uh, could talk about 
how do you bring in data from, from the vendors? Let's say, you know, through an FTP, US FTP, or how do you right. usually deal with that? It, it's not as well doc documented online as I uh, would like. So oh, right. I, I thought I'll ask you that question. Oh, okay. How so do you bring in that data from the vendor? Okay. That you, maybe you, you have a system mm -hmm. that already works for your local machine, mm -hmm. but somehow you try to do that through the cloud directly. And right, so uh, the, the question is how to basically get data in. And uh, the whole idea is that it's disconnected from the training part. So the idea is first you bring in the data. And bringing in the data you can do in multiple ways. Probably the simplest thing would be to basically uh, start up a compute engine instance and basically run the SFTP from there. Right? So you basically create a GCE instance and then you basically run SFTP or you basically or you can run a scheduled job, a cloud function. You can run what's called a transfer service, which basically lets you run things like every day, do this command to basically get the data in and use it to put the data onto this bucket. So you can write a script that basically runs. There are many ways to do it. And uh, what if, if you can do it locally on some machine, there's a way to basically install those programs on the cloud and do the exact same thing. Okay, a cloud machine is just a machine, ultimately. And uh, you, know, you may have some things around setting up the IP address and the networking appropriately, but those are all solvable. <laughs> Right, so the question is, is it possible that the vendor doesn't recognize the IP and is blocking it? That could very well be the case, and then that's something that you have to talk to whoever is providing the data to have them whitelist a set of IPs. It is possible for you to basically say, here is an IP for you to use, and we actually support that. So if you have your own IP and you want to bring it in and say, you're this cloud machine that you're creating has to have this IP address, you can do that too. So if, if the vendor only supports your current IP, you can actually move that over as well. So there are, there are several ways that you can do that. Right back here, Lai. Um, so uh, one question actually, when, so throughout the demo, mm -hmm. um, I was comparing if we need to do uh, this thing manually. So for example, um, creating notebook instances mm -hmm. or then creating clusters for training model and then not even that once model is once model is ready to be utilized by app then integrating it with the app mm -hmm. so that requires a lot of effort actually um, along like I would say um, just to manage that piece of infrastructure to perform what exactly is the main logic or main uh, task to accomplish. Yeah. Um, and I'm new to this uh, managed um, TensorFlow service, right. so, but just uh, wanted to make sure, is that the right perception that we should take, like why we should go for managed service? Absolutely, I mean, the, the, uh, that is absolutely correct, right? The, the key idea behind the managed service is focus on creating the TensorFlow model and leave this all this infrastructure management to a bunch of Google engineers whose only job is to do that. Right? And basically that frees up your team's efforts to concentrate on the things that actually bring value to you rather than to actually manage clusters and install software and figure out uh, like, the optimal ways to run things, et cetera. Right? The whole idea behind a managed service is all you maintain is code and uh, let the cloud vendor maintain the infrastructure. Yes. Like, great uh, presentation. Thank I have you, one Risa. question. I apologize if I didn't follow sure. your, uh, some of the details of your presentation. But as the real-time data comes in, mm -hmm. uh, it goes through the workflow. Correct. And that basically updates the model, correct? Not automatically. No. So, the, the, yeah. so what happens is, uh, as the real-time workflow comes, as the real-time data, data comes, comes in, in, it goes through this data flow pipeline which is basically that pipeline that I have there. Mm -hmm. And it's basically going to basically create a new training data set. New, got it. Okay? But then it is still up to you to decide when you're going to train. So you typically put that on a schedule. You say that every month mm -hmm. on the 13th of the month, I'm going okay. to launch a training job, Excellent. and it's going to basically create a new model. And it's going to deploy this model as version N plus 1 of the service. So you basically, all of the, when you deploy it, you basically specify a version. And you know that last month was version 10, this month is version 11, 
and then you can go into the console mm -hmm. and basically say send 95% of the data to version 10 and 5% to version 11, and then over time we'll migrate and all of that. Got it, that, that answers my question. I wasn't sure on the versioning because right. for, let's say, legal reasons, you mm -hmm. might want to maintain yeah. versioning for at the point in time. Absolutely, and I mean, something I didn't mention is like repeatability is a, is a core concept. I thought we had turned it off, but okay. Repeatability is a core concept, and one of the things is one of the really cool things is when you go to BigQuery, for example, you can actually put an as of. Not very people know of, know this, but you can actually put an as of in your query, and you will get the results as of a certain date. Right. So that's part of this whole repeatability idea. So you can run the query, but then in the last six days, more data got added. You don't want those results coming back. You want to get the results that you got six days ago, right? You can do that, right? That's all part of uh, this whole idea of repeatability, which is a big thing to us. So versioning is absolutely part of it. Yes. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, the, plow uh, the platform will scale automatically. Mm -hmm. So if you want to improve prediction, um, uh, you know, average time, mm -hmm. Would we be able to configure it to run on multiple d devices? Multiple okay. So if you're talking about the last part, which is basically this managed ML service for predictions, absolutely. This is something that we can scale. And you basically say, this is the number of queries per second that I want. And we'd be able to basically do the scaling automatically for you. And we can actually scale it down all the way to zero if necessary. There's no inputs coming. Scale it down to zero. And then when the first input comes up, we basically launch it up. So it's, you know, it, it's all, you know, really auto scaling means auto scaling. Okay? And that's true of pretty much every bit of, the, of this workflow, BigQuery, auto scales, right? That's why we were able to do 137 million rows in like two seconds. There's no other way you could do it. It ran like on 2,000 nodes on the background, right? That's the only way it did it. Uh, data flow, you, I, saw, I showed you that graph where it went from one to 15, so it could actually get the job done in time. And by the way, like the question is, oh my God, am I paying for 15 VMs? Isn't that expensive? Think about it, right? Whether you pay for five VMs for three hours, or you pay for 15 VMs for an hour, same cost. Get your job done earlier, right? So, and the same thing about ML Engine, right? So when you, but ML Engine is not auto-scaling today. So ML Engine, you basically say uh, how many machines you want so you can basically say, I want you to train this model on 15 machines, and they go full tilt. Auto scaling doesn't make sense in an ML because it's a repeated, repeated data set. You're just going through it over and over and over again. So we know you tell us whether you want 15 machines or 25 machines or one GPU or four GPUs, and we'll run it full tilt on that. One over here, Lai. Yes. So this is, if I understand correctly, this is for model serving, auto scaling in the same sense as Google App Engine, but Correct. not so much as Google Cloud Functions. Is right. there anything on the horizon that can be auto scaling in the same sense that cloud, as Cloud Functions? Uh, elaborate more. What do you mean by auto scaling on like Cloud Functions? So Cloud Functions, like you, you're not charged by machine. There's no server. It's not standing up. Mm -hmm. You hit the endpoint that Cloud Functions provides mm -hmm. and in a moment, it spawns another instance of your thing. Right. You can use Dataflow to make a load for it and scale mm -hmm. that up, and you can watch Correct. the rate that it's able to serve mm -hmm. go up. And this this would be interest. This would improve the economics of a case where you need like expensive GPUs to serve the model, mm -hmm. and you've got like highly variable load. Right. Right. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So you're right. This is much more of an app engine queries per second kind of scaling. Uh, it's uh, for uh, the cloud function kind of scaling, that's more of a batch thing. And I would actually do this exact solution what you talked about, uh, cloud function to data flow, and have data flow do these predictions. Is a way, and then you can basically use GPU machines and exactly what you talked about. That is the right way to approach uh, the, the, the load, like spiky load kind of situation. Data flow streaming. Uh, data flow streaming. Okay, one or two more, anybody? Yes. So 
Oh, thanks for the talk. It was great. Yeah, I just wonder that for step from one to seven, mm -hmm. how like automated it can be, like without human interruption. You how can the automation yeah. it would be. Right. Uh, the exploring and visualizing, I would not automate. Okay, so let's leave that out. Uh, so let's look at the operationalizing part of it. It's all very automatable because these are all just scripts, right? I'm just, it's all like, you know, uh, G Cloud, you know, submit a training job, submit a data flow pipeline, run a Python program. So these are all very, 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 very automatable. And you can put them all into a script. You can launch them from a cloud function. You can launch them from a cron job. So this whole, this whole workflow is automated. The two parts of the pipeline that I would not automate personally are one, the exploration, making sure your data is correct and it's, it's useful. And the second part I would not automate is what Reza pointed out. It is how do you switch from one version to the other version, right? You don't want to automatically just say that every month, right, I'm gonna to switch to the new version because you want to actually look at the evaluation results and you, know, you want to basically look at how the two models treat a certain canonical set of uh, important inputs, right? Say, so what does it do? What, what kind of predictions does it make for these 10 cases? Just do a sanity check before you make that the default version. Right, so that leads to another follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So it's great talk, as I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So one part missing for mm -hmm. me is the evaluation of the trained model. Mm -hmm. So. Right, uh, it, yeah, I did not, uh, I kind of skipped through it because we were running through time, but the whole evaluation comes that as you are training, you start looking at graphs like this in TensorBoard, and it gives you an idea of whether layers are dying, it gives you loss curves, it gives you evaluation curves, and you start looking at those to basically determine if things are overfitting, if things are, if your layers are too deep, et cetera. I kind of skip, skipped over that, but yes, absolutely, you're right. While it's training, you don't just let it train, you monitor using TensorBoard, absolutely. Thanks for your answer. Sure. One final, any other final questions? All right, everybody, give us a big round of applause for Mr. Lack. Any, any final words? No. Very good. Well, he's going to have an opportunity. You're going to have an opportunity to go outside. If you have some questions for LAC, we're going to be around for about an hour, an hour and a half. There's several Googlers here. If you have any questions uh, beyond what was covered today, we're more than happy to help. Again, we really appreciate you all coming in. I think just by the turnout today, uh, you can see there's a lot of interest in this area. And just the, the, the final story, you think about how, how ML can change people's lives and, and many times you know, we talk, there's a lot of scary conversations about there, out there about ML. Uh, but one example today is um, uh, my wife. Um, if, you, if you're not a Google Photos user, and I know Lack talks, he talks about all the different ways um, that we do this here at Google. But if you're not a Google Photos user, um, it's really impressive to me that every day or every couple of days I get a notification that talks about what happened a year ago, what happened about three years ago. And one of the things that really stuck out to me when I was having lunch with Lack today when I asked about like what makes us so different here at Google, and, and it's something that is very simple, but it hopefully can help you in your business. It's about delighting users. So when those moments come up on my Google Photos app, I typically send them to my wife and she tells me to stop sending them because they make her cry because it's usually about one of our kids. Um, but when you think about how ML has just changed that ability to look back in time or that ability to think about something that you would have never normally thought of, it's pretty interesting. So hopefully today you're able to take something away um, from this talk and if you have anything beyond uh, what you heard today, we've got experts in the room. We're more than happy to have further conversations. So please stick around, uh, have a drink, have some snacks. We really appreciate you coming out. Have a great afternoon.